again to everyone, those of you that are here in the sanctuary and in Brown Chapel, as well as watching online. You see from your bulletin that we have are finishing today our great words of the Christian faith. This is the first major subset of our year um, of fullness. We encourage you to go online if you're just joining us. There are 13 words that we believe are foundational for our understanding of Christianity. Three words reflect our choice. Now, we know that we love him because he first loved us. We know that everything in salvation begins with the Lord, but it begins by offering us some choices. And if we choose wisely, we choose repentance, faith, and confession. Definition are on the cards. We then see that when we choose wisely, some changes occur in us, and we are regenerated, we are adopted, we are converted. And the series goes into detail to explain what these things are. Because God has given us the chance to make choice and we made the right choice, he affected change in us, and that resulted in some consequences. And the consequences of our God-given choice and his change that he affects in us is that we are forgiven, we are justified, we are redeemed, and we are reconciled. And then the final four words, or three words rather, have to do with the challenge. Now what we mean by challenge is that even though we know we're saved, we're on our way to heaven, um, there are still dynamics of the Christian life that we need to live out. And this is where our struggle is sometimes. It's not that faith doesn't work. It does work. But it's um, like two sides of the coin. On one hand, salvation is a gift from God. On the other hand, the other side of the coin, it is a stewardship of life. We're never saved by works. We're always saved by grace. But we need to wrap our arms around the idea of sanctification, and that will lead us to assurance. We said that assurance is uh, maybe one of the words that we're a little bit weaker on in our particular brand of Christianity. Um, holiness, we've, we teach such a strong mes message of holiness that if we're not careful, it can sound like we're preaching a message of works. And we're not preaching a message of works, but we do preach holy living. But in the midst of that holy living, he gives us assurance. Now, the last word that we want to talk about today is the word glorification. And by the way, I know you can get this online, but if you are part of our live stream congregation, if you want a hard copy of this, uh, like this, you can just contact the church and we'll be glad to get one of these to you. Uh, let's look to the screen and let's pray together as our custom is. And as we begin our service, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I've heard some little voices uh, praying along with us. You made my day. You are doing a fantastic job. Fantastic job. This idea of glorification today is, uh, if, if assurance is the one that's most difficult for us, Probably glorification is the one that we know the least about, not because it's obscure, but because we just have not taken the idea of glorification nearly far enough. We know that God receives all glory and, and we do things for the glory of God. We know that God is worthy of all honor and glory and he said, my glory will I give to none other. And that's true, but there is also a, a, a rest of the story 
that goes with that. We need to understand that God is going to share his glory. Now, ultimately, what that phrase means when he said, I will share my glory with no other, it means that nobody's going to be his equal. Nobody is, will ever merit praise and worship the way he merits praise and worship. But he does do something absolutely magnificent, and that is he takes of his glory, and he does two things. He shows us his glory from time to time. Have you ever been in a service where you're just overwhelmed with the presence of God, or maybe you've been to a service where you were just so overwhelmed by the very presence of God, you end up on the floor. We call it being slain in the spirit or falling under the power of God. Um, Israel saw his glory like a cloud on top of the mountains or even in the holy place. God will show us his glory, and we acknowledge that, but he also he also makes a very special promise, and that is when we get to heaven, it's going to be more than harps and angels. We are going to become recipients of his glory. We will inherit his glory. Now, we don't think we'll ever be like him in that sense of the word. Now, John said we will be like him, but we're not going to be equal to him. We'll always be less than him, but so much more than we are. It overwhelms us, and I don't think we understand that heaven is going to be about us receiving God's glory. We will receive his glory. The things that we just bump shoulders with now will be our atmosphere and our state of being when we get to heaven. I was talking to one of my grandchildren the other day, and we were talking about a very important moment when a spaceship was about to land on uh, uh, Altair 4, and it showed very clearly the sun and, and the moon, and it led to a conversation. And so they're going to land, Papa, on the sun? And I said, no, they can't land on the sun. I said, we can't go anywhere near the sun because the sun is so powerful and the sun is so big and the sun is such fire. That's how it gives us light and we could never land on the sun. And he said, then how do we land on the moon? It's got light and it's full of fire. And I had to explain, and, and I, I tried to remember how to explain it to a four-year-old, that you've got the sun that we cannot approach, and we've got the moon that we have explored and landed on and walked on. They are both light givers. What's the difference? And I tried to explain to him that the sun is the light. The moon is just a reflector of the sun. And I tried to explain to him about the reflector. And I went to, I think, a pretty good detail. And then I got another question. So why can't we land on the sun and like we land on the moon? And I realized this is, I said, this is something you'll learn when you're five. So, um, <laughs> but loved ones, I want us to look at the glory of God as an introduction to what he is going to do for us, glorification. We are going to be glorified. We are going to be sharers of his glory. But I want you to understand, he is the sun. And right now, all we see are reflections of his glory. Oh, he can come any way he wants to, but whenever we get into his glory, it's temporary. Have you ever noticed that when you're overcome by the power of God and you end up on the floor, which happens from time to time, have you ever noticed that you always get up? The, the inability to get up passes, you can get up. And we don't, we don't teach that as a, you have to have this experience to know the glory of God. It's just one of the ways we experience the glory of God. But it passes Moses. His face was transformed by the glory of God, so much so that he wore a veil because people couldn't really even look on him, the moon reflecting the glory of the Son of God. Um, but it faded. 
it faded. In fact, theologians say it's not clear if Moses wore the veil to hide the glory or if Moses wore the veil because the glory was fading. We, you know, in, in other words, it's a transitory thing. The, the, the cloud would come into the temple, but then it would leave the temple. Um, we never have a full grasp on the glory of God. Moses said, show me your glory, perhaps more effectively and intensely and persistently than any man that ever lived. And God said, Moses, that's not going to work, but I tell you what I can do for you. I will walk by and I'll let you see the residue of my passing. I'll let you see the backside of God. And these are pictures of the glory of God. Now, I want you to understand three things as we kind of go forward. Number one, we do see the glory of God on, on some levels, the Bible says when we look at creation, we see the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens speak of his firmament, but that's a low level glory. We just look at that and say, mm, 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 mm. God is awesome. This is just a reflection of his glory. We may also experience moments of his glory in an altar, you ever been in an altar service where you just felt like heaven couldn't be any better than this? Or you were going through such a tough time and God met you in your tough place. And even though nobody else was around, you felt that God just riveted all of heaven's glory on you, helped you with your tough time. And I, I believe in those things. <laughs> and we need those things from time to time. But they don't always come that way. And when they do come that way, they fade, they pass away. It's not because the product is inferior. It's because glory, hear me now, glory is for the next age. Glorification is for the next age. God shows us pockets of his glory to teach us a little bit about him and to show us a foretaste of the future, but we don't live in glory, not that way. Now we move from glory to glory, and there's a sense in which every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, and there's a sense in which there is glory on this earth, and there's a sense that we grow in glory, there's a sense in which we can give glory back to God. But we need to understand that the glorification that is coming to us is something for another age. It doesn't mean we're not to seek it. In fact, we ought to be growing in it. But we need to put our heads right up against about five principles today that will help us understand how to live the glorious Christian life. Number one, I want to talk to you about some other terms that were used to describe the glory. Um, for instance, I mean, we'll, we'll get to these things, but uh, whenever God moved into the temple on the day of, of dedication, his presence, his glory was so strong that the priests couldn't even do their ministry. It was like a cloud that filled the house. There are records from the Azusa Street Revival in the first decade of the 20th century. It didn't happen all the time, but sometimes there would be a cloud that would just descend into the meeting place. And sometimes it seemed like it was the whole place, but sometimes it would be a place in the building. And records tell us that some people knew it was the presence of God and they just fell on their faces in honor and reverence and fear of God. Others were frightened by it and would flee the building. But something that happened that was absolutely remarkable Children would often leave their mama's laps and run into the cloud and you could not see the children and, but you could hear them laughing and they would run in and out of the cloud and after the cloud left they would tell of going to heaven in the cloud and playing with angels. Some said they saw Jesus and, and we believe it was just a little taste of heaven. Uh, it was just a little moment of the glory of God. 
didn't happen all the time and everybody's experience was not the same. But there are some terms, there are some moments when the glory of God was seen. We want to take a quick look at that. We want to understand that it was modeled by Jesus. We are to have the glory of God in our lives now. But we need to understand that Jesus was the model of how to live in the glory without, you know, floating off the ground 24 hours a day. Number three, we want to understand, and this is so important, that glory will not abide in the realm of pride and arrogance. If we try to live in the glory and there's pride and arrogance in our heart, one of two or three things can happen, and we need to know that. Number four, there's a word that every Christian needs to be aware of, or at least the principle of the word, and the word is kenosis, kenosis. It's a Greek word describing Paul's theology of Jesus coming to earth found in Philippians chapter 2. It's called the self-emptying. When Jesus came, he was full of glory. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. It was something we'd never seen before, haven't seen since, never will see. It was Jesus and Jesus only. But he was just as much man as though he were not God at all. And he was just as much God as though he were not man at all. Jesus wasn't the Arnold Palmer of the spiritual world, you know, a mixture of one thing and another. He was not half man and half God. He was a perfect blending, and the only way that could be accomplished is by what we call the kenosis. So we'll talk about that just briefly. We need to know, number five, that the down payment of the Holy Spirit that we have uh, that manifests itself in assurance and faith and all these things is also connected to the glory of God. So in the Christian experience of salvation, there will be moments of glory, but it's not glory as a perpetual state. That will be heaven. But it's glory all along the way. And we need to be aware of what those things represent. Let's read a couple of verses to get our bearings here. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, the grace by which we stand, some versions say, and listen to this, we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. This is salvation in the future. We will share God's glory. It's repeated in Colossians 1.27 this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Now, we don't share that glory now except in just very little measure. Remember, as wonderful as the indwelling Holy Spirit is, that's just a down payment. That's just a token of what is to come. And Colossians says Christ lives in you, and the part uh, part of Christ living in you is to give you assurance about something that's coming, and it is that you will share in his glory. Now, we're going to wrap up coming back to this idea, so this is important. The scriptural idea, the, the, uh, um, there, there are about four major words that are translated glory, but in the Old Testament, the scriptural idea of glory um, that was most easily grasped was the idea of weighty reputation or weighty significance. It was the idea of weight. It was to say God is weighty. And now we're not talking about spiritual obesity, but God is, is an awesome presence. I remember meeting um, a general in the armed services, general in the Marine Corps, and I was so impressed. I thought he had so many ribbons on. He had so many medals, uh, and in, including the Medal of Honor, and 
I thought, this, this is amazing. How does he stand up straight with this kind of thing? And the person that introduced me, I said, I am impressed with those ribbons. He said, well, he's been through three wars and two conflicts. And he said, and I'll tell you this, he doesn't wear half the ribbons and medals he deserves. It would just tear his, his coat off if he wore them. Now, he was exaggerating a little bit, but that's the way, that's what we mean by weight. God's awesomeness is a weight. It's a, you know what it's like for somebody that comes into the room and they are just a great person, a noteworthy person, a person you've always wanted to meet. And they don't come in to try to show off. But the moment they step into the room, there's a weightiness that enters the room. And it's because of the character of that person. Everything, the very atmosphere in the room changes. That is just a tiny sliver, the tiniest sliver of what it's like when God enters the room. When God comes in, that's why we want the presence of God because God can correct more in our life in 30 seconds than 30 years of counseling can uh, correct. We're not opposed to counseling. We're not opposed to studying and learning and trying to get better. We're not opposed to any of that. But God, there's a weightiness about him. When he comes in the room, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take much in the eyes of the flesh. You know, we used to sing that, that, uh, uh, that song when, when, uh, when I was, was growing up, Reach Out and Touch the Lord. As he passes by. The, the idea that he may, you may be like people in scripture. Jesus is just passing by. You don't need an extended exposure. If you can just touch him. If he can just brush up against you. It's enough. That's what the idea of weightiness means. Loved ones, bear with me while I just vent a little bit today. That's why I say it's so important for us to reclaim our altar time. That's why I say it's so important. I know you can hear the word and go home and be changed. I know you can hear the word at home and be changed. I'm not against any of that. But there is something that our, that our grandfathers and great-grandfathers and great-great-grandmothers understood. There's nothing that replaces us coming into the presence of God and waiting on Him to just brush by us because that's the way the glory of God is. Can work Now, he can do it any way that he wants to, but it means weight, weighty reputation or weighty significance. The card definition that you have on your card is that glorification is the assurance that in the next age we will reign with him and be playing a part in the governance of his creation. We will be glorified in the next life not just so we can play harps. I mean, I don't, if you want to, it's fine. I'd rather get a banjo, but I'll take whatever. <laughs> when he says, I will be glorified, it doesn't just mean I'll have eternal life. It means that I will share that indefinable weight of his presence. And I will assist, you will assist in the reigning and ruling of his kingdom. We don't know what that will look like. Billy Graham said, we may be as glorified saints, we may be the equivalent of angels to another civilization. I mean, there's no verse for that. And don't, don't go look on you know, the dark web trying to figure that out. I'm, I'm just saying, we don't even know what that is going to look like. But everything that heaven will be, it will be connected with his glory. We would not have the capacity or even the, the idea of it apart from the glory of God. Now, let's walk through these things quickly. We said there are other terms. When we are introduced to glory, first of all, there are some incomprehensible images. Remember now, understanding glory is reserved for the next age. We understand with our very limited base of understanding that glory can be seen, can be felt, but not comprehended. We are not going to go to any revival and come away understanding the glory of God. 
We're not going to go to any conference and say, oh, now I understand the glory of God. No, the fact of the matter is when glory shows up, it's often unexpected and we don't have a clue what to do with it when it does show up. Uh, For instance, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus, who modeled this so beautifully, we'll talk about it in just a moment. Jesus was just a normal looking man from Galilee until on that Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and James and John, his physical flesh gave way to a little bit of his glory. The Jesus you read about in Revelation 1 and 2 looks a lot different. Looks a lot, well, in three, looks a lot different than Jesus from Galilee. It's because we see Jesus in Revelation in his glory, in his glory. Um, the, the women who saw him on resurrection day, he was not even in his glory at that point yet. He had a resurrected body, but they spent so many days with him up close. They knew Jesus as well as anybody, but when they saw him, they didn't know it was Jesus until he started speaking to them. And then they realized who he was. It's, it's a phenomenal thing. Um, And on the Mount of Transfiguration, his glory began to show through. They heard Moses and Elijah. I mean, Jesus was the feature, but can you imagine a bonus of Moses and Elijah? I mean, and, and when they came out of that, you would have thought they would have just been speechless. And they really were speechless. They just didn't know it. So many times we're speechless and just don't know it. And we speak anyway. (laughs) And what they probably should have done is just gone on their face and just, oh, you know, oh. But Peter said, let's build some statues. (laughs) Well, it wasn't the time or the place or the occasion for memorials or statues or monuments or buildings. It was the time to behold the glory. And the Bible says he said that because he didn't know what to say. Our tendency is to think when we see glory, whether we see it in a church service, or we see it in our devotional life, or we see it somewhere else, our tendency is to think, okay, I need to respond to this. I need to react to this. I need to deal with this. And loved ones, there are going to be things you and I have no idea of how to deal with especially when it comes to the glory of God, because the glory of God can be seen when God allows it, but it cannot be comprehended. Um, It's the idea, like we said about Moses, Moses, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. And Moses saw a lot of the glory of God. We're going to find out in a minute that the Bible says God spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. That was the idea of Moses and God had conversations. I don't know what the conversations looked like or sounded like, but he spoke to a man as a man speaks to his friend. But the Bible says he just made Moses hungry for more and more of the glory of God. And God never condemned him for wanting to see his glory. But this is what God said. Moses, this is going to be the best I can do as long as you're in the flesh. I will pass by and you will see the residue of my passing. Uh, the, The backside of God as I pass. We don't know if that meant like a human backside or if it meant that just a residue, just a cloud just the dust of footprint. We don't know what it was. But Moses was not capable to behold the glory of God. But God said, in effect, you've done good to want to see my glory. It's, first of all now, it's incomprehensible images, things that can be seen but can't be explained, things that can be seen but not comprehended. It's also unapproachable awesomeness. It's like a devouring fire or a light that's too, T-O-O, too intense to be observed. Too intense to be observed. 
the people saw the presence of God on the mountains. And there's indication that there was an invitation for the people to draw near. But when they realized the awesomeness and didn't want to come near, they, they, they clicked into self-preservation mode. They said, well, no, it's close enough. Moses, you go see what he wants. You come back and tell us. And the average Christian today is content to have somebody else hear from God. We want them to go into the presence of God and come back and tell us, whether it's through a sermon or a prophecy or a dream. And we don't understand that God's glory invites us all to approach Him. But it's, it's, there, there is an unapproachable awesomeness. The only way you can approach this awesomeness is by being invited by God to come. The, the elders of Israel were never allowed. God put a fence around the mountain and said, don't come any closer, this is going to kill you. Uh, I don't think that was God's intent, original intent. But he said, Moses, you can come into my presence. And Joshua accompanied him. We'll talk about that in a second. But the elders of Israel were able to approach part way up the mountain and they saw the glory of God and the ground before them was transformed, unapproachable awesomeness. Here's number three, an indescribable covering. God said, my glory is like the, the, uh, the cloud of fire or the pillar of cloud in the, the wilderness we, you know, it's just described as a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud, but we know that it was so massive and so awesome that they, it directed them for 40 years. It said, stay here or move. It was a pillar of cloud in the day that cooled the temperature as they lived in that hot and unlivable desert. The pillar of cloud brought the temperature down, but then because there's no cloud covering in such a thin atmosphere, when night falls and the sun goes away, it's as cold at the night as it was hot during the day. So God gave them the pillar of fire at night to keep them warm. So they had central air and heat <laughs> provided by the glory of God. You say, oh, no, it was, to, it was to lead them. Well, the Bible says sometimes the cloud would stay where it was for a day, sometimes a month, sometimes for a year. The cloud could just come and go if that was all it was. But it was, uh, it was a covering that was uh, just indescribable to the people of God. When it would show up in the temple with Solomon on the dedication of the temple. And at other times, it was just indescribable. The priests who had everything lined out were unable to do anything because of the indescribable covering of the Lord. So that's the first thing I want you to understand. The glorification that we're going to receive is not comprehensible with our human minds. It's not controllable with our human hands. And it is beyond our greatest expectation or understanding in this world. Here's number two. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hurry here because I, this is just an introduction that I can do. It was modeled by Jesus. Jesus is the only person that we ever see this in. He's the only one. Um, but he modeled two dynamics of life perfectly. He was perfect humility. He was so unobtrusive. He was so perfectly human that when the temple police with the high priest wanted to arrest Jesus, it was necessary for Judas to kiss him on the cheek so they would know who Jesus was. You would have thought he'd had a halo or fire coming out of his ears or be a foot and a half taller than anyone else. But they said, how will we know it's him? Because he is meek and lowly. He lives in humility. Judah said, well, the one I kiss on the cheek, that's him. That's him. Now, but at the same time, there were moments of unveiling. There were moments where Jesus, who was so uh, so humble and so sweet-natured that children that didn't even know him would run to him 
to be blessed by him. There were also moments when that Jesus who stepped into a place, the demons began to manifest and demons began to speak and say, we know who you are. Don't send us away before the time to the place of torment. And he balanced that marvelous, marvelous glory like the glory of the trans, mountain of transformation and the humility of the cross. He balanced that amazing ability to stand and rebuke a storm. And they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? He showed that amazing power to speak to the cemetery and say, Lazarus, come forth. And one preacher used to say that he had to say, Lazarus, come forth, because there was so much glory coming through at that moment that if he had just said, come forth, everybody in the grave would have come forward. But he's back and forth, back and forth to our eyes. But what's happening is Jesus says, we live in the glory of God, but God controls the manifestation you know, I hear people say, well, if, if God would give me the gift of healing, I'd just start at the top floor of the hospital and work my way all the way down. And if he'd just give me the gift of healing, that's exactly why you don't have a gift of healing. Because you're saying, if God would give me the ability, I'd do this, I'd do this, I'd do this, I'd do this. And Jesus understood the principle, I only do what Father tells me to do. I only do what Father says I ought to do. I only do what I hear Father say. So he had this amazing ability to walk in utter dependence on the Lord, but total faith when Father showed him what to do. Loved ones, we are given, you say, well, why does he even show us his glory if it's not for the next life? Because we are in school right now. We are getting on the job training. It was modeled beautifully by Jesus. There's a passage that just baffles me. Every time I read it, almost every time I read it, I break down in tears to think of the wonder of it. Jesus came full of grace and truth. Full of grace, full of truth. We have moments we're full of grace and we have moments we're full of truth. We call it moods. Sometimes we are incredibly gracious. Sometimes we're incredibly judgmental. That's what truth was talking about. Things will be set right. But Jesus was fully, fully consumed with grace at every moment. And at the same moment, he was fully, fully consumed with judgment and truth at the same moment. You say, Pastor, you're giving me a headache. I know it's because it's beyond our comprehension, but this is that vision into glory. When we see the unexplainable, we understand that we're just connecting, just barely connecting to glory. And if we don't know how to connect, it can, it can, it can really throw us for a loop. I remember first time I went to England, uh, you know, they told me, you know, can I take my hair dryer? Yeah, you just got to plug it into a converter. Well, I thought, I didn't know that a converter was different than a plug adapter. You got to have both. You get a plug adapter that goes on your converter and you plug in the converter. And um, I want to tell you something. When I, when I got ready to dry my hair in London and I plugged it in, so far so good till I hit the on button. And I want to tell you, it was a good foot and a half, two feet flamethrower that just, whoosh. at first I thought, awesome. And then I thought, thank God I wasn't pointing this to my head. And I found out it's, it's one thing to just get a plug adapter. See, we, 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 we try to pursue the glory with plug adapters. I'll go to this service. I'll go hear this preacher. I'll go to this conference. I'll do this. I'll do this. Uh, but we need a total converter before we're able to really plug in. And most folks don't try to get a converter. They just are happy with a plug adapter. Glory, here's number three. Are you with me so far? Okay. Glory will not abide in the realm of... Pro oh, Never mind. I'll tell that story later. Glory will not about my hair dryer. Glory will not abide in the realm of pride and arrogance. We, we are like 
if we're not careful, and I'm, I'm not, this is not an indictment because I hope I'm not seeing anybody that, that, that this is true of, but it's a danger that we have to look out for. Glory will not abide in the realm of pride and arrogance. And a lot of times we want the glory. We want the glory. We seek the glory. We are critical of those who don't have the glory we want them to have or, or produce things we want produced. And we become very, very critical. But glory will bite you in the butt if you try to approach it with pride and arrogance. I mean, you think the Nazis and raiders of the lost ark had problems with the ark? You don't want to try to pursue the glory of God with pride and arrogance in your heart. Because I want to tell you, one of three things will, will happen. The first and perhaps the most merciful thing that can happen is that it just kills you. I mean, it just kills you. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if you come to church and your heart's not right, God's going to kill you. No, um, but the, the Philistines thought they had won the battle when they, when they took the ark of God captive. And they found out that people were, were afflicted and some died. And it was, it was it, they, you don't want the glory of God with pride and arrogance. Now, um, uh, Uzzah thought, and I know this is hard to understand, and it's a sermon for another time, but he thought that he could just steady the ark when the oxen stumbled. He thought he could just steady it with his hand. They had already made one mistake that God showed incredible mercy over. They moved the ark on an ox cart, and it was only to be moved by the Levites with the carrying pole. So God's already having mercy and as far as we know, we, 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 there was some kind of disrespect. There was some type of arrogance or pride. When the oxen stumbled and it looked like the ark was going to fall, he said, oh, I'll take care of this. And he put his hand on it and he died. Now that may be the most merciful thing that God does when we take his glory as our own. But two other things that are devastating Number one, or, or number two, I should say, first of the other two, is either the glory will depart. I tell you what, you look at the book of Ezekiel, and it's the story of Israel about to go into captivity. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem preaching that captivity was coming. Ezekiel had gone into captivity. He was one of the first group of captives, went into captivity um, uh, e either in 606 or, or in uh, about 592, somewhere in there. He, there were three deportations, and Ezekiel went in one of the first two. And he was in Babylon telling them that the Spirit of God was going to leave, and the, the, the temple would fall, and Jerusalem would be destroyed. And he shows a picture of God moving, the Spirit of God moving out of Jerusalem. First it moves from the holy place. Then it moves to an, a, another place. Then it moves to the outer wall of the temple. Then it moves to the outer wall of the city. And every time it stops to see what the city will do as the Spirit of God moves further and further, just like it was preparing to move out of the life of Samson when he was playing games with his anointing. The time came when the scripture says that Samson always played games and he always got away with it. The Spirit of God would help him. But one time he played games one day too many and then he got up and said, I'll shake myself as before. I'll whip their tails as before. But this is what the scripture says. But he did not know that the Spirit of God had departed from him, And then you know the rest of the story. And in Ezekiel, we see the, the Spirit of God being ignored. Then we see him being abused. Then we see him being dishonored. Then we see him being ignored. And then we see him looking out on the temple as if to say, is there not anyone who will make a case for me to stay? And then he leaves the temple. And long before the temple fell, the temple was without the spirit of the living God. So the glory will either depart or something that's more frightening. I, I, every time I, uh, let's go on. I'm too full today. But, uh, 
The, the third thing that can happen is either, the, either God deals harshly and takes a life or the glory departs or God gives them over to lies. When we look at Romans 1, uh, what we find out the most frightening thing in Romans 1 is the same thing that we see happening in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now Romans 1 was a look back. A look back even into the Old Testament days. First Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians 2 is a look ahead to the days of Antichrist. And the Bible says that people were concerned in Thessalonica that they had missed the return of the Lord. And Paul said the, the day of the Lord will not come until there is first a great falling away. And in that great falling away, at the, at the, apparently after that falling away occurs, it will open the door for Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who is a great deceiver. And it talks about him setting himself up as God and, uh, and being worshipped as God. But then it comes to this most frightening verse. It says, and because people did not ex receive the knowledge of the truth. See, that's why we need to be very careful with how we treat Scripture. Pastors need, pastors need to, to be on their face in fear before they stand in a pulpit or sit in the pulpit and preach because it is an incredibly frightening thing. God says, because they would not receive the knowledge of the truth, what happened? God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And what happens when you're given over to a reprobate mind? You believe a lie. And a lie becomes your truth. And the result of making a lie the truth is damnation. And loved ones, we're in a society that wants to talk about my truth, my experience, my understanding. And loved ones, I know that we need to be concerned about justice and all of those other things. That's not what I'm talking about. But we need to understand there's only one path to justice, and that is through God's Word. So we need to understand that when God shows glory, when God gives us mercy, we need to tap into that mercy and not carry with us pride and arrogance. Um, here's number four. Jesus' glory was the result of his kenosis or self-emptying. Now what that means, that's in Philippians 2, and boy that's a study in and of itself that I don't have time to deal with today. But what Paul says Jesus did, fully God, fully man, perfectly blended, Jesus understood that for him to be perfectly blended as fully God and fully man, he must give up some of his inherent rights as God. King James says that he did not see equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he said, I'm, I'm going to become less in the eyes of men. I'm going to give up some of my rights, even though it's only temporary. For instance, when Jesus came, he could not be everywhere at once. He, he could not be a lot of things because he was to model for us how to live a redeemed life. So a lot of things that were his right as God, he laid over here to the side. Now praise God, he's back with it all now. And we praise the Lord for that. But for instance, whenever Jesus was talking about the return of the Son of Man, he says angels don't know. Even the Son of Man doesn't know. And loved ones, I don't think for a minute that if we went to heaven today, uh, some, some, one of us died, went to heaven, said, Jesus, you can tell me. I'm up here. I'm with you now. When are you coming back to earth? Jesus wouldn't say, I don't know. It's up to the Father. No, I think Jesus knows exactly when he's coming back. I think what Jesus was saying was this. In my state, as the Son of Man, I had to give up all knowledge. I had to give up this, that, and the other. Uh, you say, but Jesus did all kinds of things. Yes, but we believe that it was because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit on him. Some things he did as God, but other things he did as a man who believed in God. I, and I think when Jesus was on earth, he did not know everything like he knew as God. And when he said, even the Son of Man doesn't know, he said, that's something I had to lay aside. I'm living by faith. Now, don't worry. If you don't agree with me on that, you can still go to heaven. It just, you just won't get in the fast pass lane because, 
No, I, and seriously, I could be wrong about that. That's just, that's my opinion. I think Jesus certainly knows when he's returning, but I think when he was on earth, because he laid aside some of his rights to divinity, he, he was limited in some ways. That's why he was fully man and fully God. But loved ones, the point I'm trying to make is this. Jesus, who had a full understanding of glory, Jesus, who had a full understanding of glorification, realized that we serve as we're learning about glorification. We don't inherit glorification in its fullness and then think, you know, it's like when you started in Little League, or at least when I started in Little League, I, I grew up when baseball was king and the greatest baseball players were home run hitters. Mickey Mantle uh, I, I was, was my hero. Roger Maris, Willie Mays, these guys, phenomenal. And we all wanted to hit home runs like Mickey and Willie. And about my third year in baseball, we were introduced to the idea of a bunt. And bunts were for sissies. <laughs> bunts were for girls. Bunts were for people who weren't strong enough to hold the bat up. And um, most of us, when we were learning to bunt, and you, and you know what, I mean, a bunt is when you, you move from your swinging position to you really, you, you hold the bat like this, and you just want to touch the ball. You just want to touch it. It's important that you watch it all the way in because it is the most precise form of hitting there is. And, and a bunt is not a glory move. In fact, it's usually called a sacrifice bunt because you're going to get thrown out almost always. But what you do when you bunt is you realize there are people on base and by me bunting, I'm going to move every infielder out of their position. Every infielder's coming out of their position. And that means the guys on base advance into scoring position. Um, and, but when we first started bunt, we got down in position. And then when the ball came in, we tried to bunt like this. You know, we tried to give it a bunt hit. And the coach was saying, no, that's not a bunt. And you know what? When you got good with bunting, you know what else you found? You not only just let the ball touch your bat, you, you learn to, when just before it hits your bat, you give just a little. You give just a little. That slows the bunt down even more and makes it harder to handle. So you're not only are you not swinging with power, you have already eviscerated your swing and then you're going to let it come in and you're going to eviscerate yourself further. I, all that I'm after, the coach says, is for you to touch the ball. And if you touch it, it'll go four or five feet this way. It'll go four or five feet this way. And it'll make those guys run and get into scoring position. And we, none of us like that because we measured greatness by home runs. That's the kind of person that's consumed with glory. What you need to be consumed with is being what the coach tells you to be in order to serve the cause. And until we learn the power of spiritual bunting, we will be nothing but celebrities. We will be nothing but people that are trapped by their giftings. We'll be nothing but people that are critics of those that have, you know, lesser abilities in the kingdom. We'll be critical of those that don't do it the way we want them to do it. But what we understand is that when you live in kenosis like Jesus did, you don't have to be on top. You don't have to be in the limelight. Um, I, it came home to us one time when we won a game because of a bunt. Now, I want to tell you, I hit two home runs in that game. Only time I've ever hit two home runs in my life, except in my dreams. I've hit six or eight in my dreams. But... <laughs> I hit two home runs, and when the coach gave the game ball, I thought, he gave it to the bunter. Because I, 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 I hit the home runs, 
But the bunter moved people into scoring position when we were behind that enabled us to win the game. That's why when we get to heaven, the more we understand about glory, the more it will seem perfectly logical to us that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. You see, because we serve in an upside down kingdom and God shows us his glory for two reasons. Number one, he wants us to get glimpses every now and then of how wonderful he is. But he wants us to understand we're going to be endued with his glory when we get there. And we need to begin to learn how to let glory be glory instead of glorifying us. Because you know what? I, I think even though we will, res, we will share his glory, I don't think it's going to be to glorify us. I think it means that we will be able to do more to honor him. Okay. Um, oh, I got to quit, so I will. Let, I'm, I'm going to leave off the last thing and, and just say this. All of us have the privilege of acknowledging God's glory through worship, praise, obedience, and humility. We have to understand, loved ones, that even though the glory is His, even though the glory is temporary, it's something that we grow in. And and then we'll wrap it up with our lessons. There's an increase. Remember, first of all, no matter how much glory we get, it's just a sliver. It's just a sliver of what will be ours. It's the spirit is called the down payment. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is an increase of glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Loved ones, our goal is not to have a life that's full of stuff. Our goal is to have a life where we learn every day we know better how to handle his glory and how to respect it. Like Moses, we have to welcome his glory, though the manifestation is temporary. Like Joshua, we must seek the presence of his glory, even though it's not yet our time. Pastor, if it's for the next age, I'll just wait and concentrate when I get there. Look at what um, Joshua did. Joshua was not invited into the very presence of God the way Moses did. But he was Moses' bodyguard. He was Moses' second. And he was allowed to go up into the mountain and to the tent of, of, of meeting where Moses would go. And Moses would have these conversations with God where God would speak to him as a friend. And then Moses would put his veil on and go back to the children of God to talk to them. I'm afraid if I'd been Joshua, I would have wanted to go down with him for a photo opportunity. For the Pentecostal evangel, for Christian uh, Christianity today, they'd be taking a picture of Moses with his veil, and I'd be there. I, I was with him. I heard stuff. I heard stuff. I saw stuff. But you know what Joshua did? When Moses was done and Moses went down, Joshua handed him off to the other elders. And this is what he did. He went and laid at the door. Knew he wasn't worthy to go in. But he laid at the door and just said, Lord, let me know the glory that I'm allowed to know. Let me know. the. I don't know how much he knew about one day he would have. God would say to him, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I don't know what he knew or what, I did, what he didn't know. But there was something intuitive. He said, glory is here. I don't understand it. It's not mine yet. It may never be mine, but I am never going to turn my back on glory. I'm going to learn as much about glory as I can. And he just laid down on that. Now, from glory to glory, we'll talk about that later. What are the Christian life lessons? This is just summary. And I think I can do this in two minutes. As we grow toward glorification, we can do it in at least four ways. Number one is acknowledgement. Give glory to God now. First of all, admit right now that you don't decide the doctrine. You don't decide when God is just or unjust. Somebody said one time, well, God's got a lot of explaining to do. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. That is such an arrogant thing. 
you know, um, we, we want God to tell us what we want to hear. And when God is silent, we get so upset. We're in a society today, and this has become such a catchphrase, your silence speaks volumes. You know what that is an attempt to do? That is an attempt to say, if you don't say what I want you to say, you're saying the opposite. Well, read Proverbs. Sometimes silence shows how profoundly wise you are. But we are in a culture that says you not only have to answer for yourself, but you better answer right. And we do that with God. God's got a lot to answer for. Guys, I don't want to scare you, but you've got a lot to answer for. I've got a lot to answer for. We need to give glory to God now. Whenever Joshua had Achan and his family cornered and they knew by the revelation of the Holy Spirit that they were guilty of thievery and guilty of disobeying God. What did Joshua tell him to do? He said, all right, Achan, give God the glory. That makes no sense. He's just been caught with his pants down. Give God the glory. What he was saying was, Achan, you need to understand, the way God has glory is for us to understand he doesn't have a lot to answer for. We have a lot to answer for. So acknowledgement, give God glory now. Number two, alignment. Learn to dwell in the glory when God permits manifestations. John Kilpatrick, pastor of Brownsville, when that great revival broke out there, the church had been praying for two years um, for revival on Sunday nights. They gave up their Sunday night service and prayed for two years for revival. And Kilpatrick was in the sanctuary praying Saturday night before Father's Day when the revival broke out. And um, he said, I turned off the lights, started out. He said, the sanctuary was dark, but I could see the lights going out into the foyer. I, that's the way I went every Sunday night. I knew the church like the back of my hand. He said, so I'm just kind of plugging along. I'm running late for supper. And he said, I, whoop, he said, I ran into something when there was nothing there. And he said, I fell back. He said, it hurt me. He said, it hurt me. And he said, I had a sense when I went down that this was something spiritual that I ran into. And I knew that God's glory was moving into that place. He said, I didn't think it was a demon. He said, I got up, I was hurt. I went to the phone, called my wife and said, honey, I, I, I'm, I'm coming. I don't know what just happened, but I think I just ran square into the angel of the Lord. And it knocked me down. And I have a sense of God's glory is going to show up. And he later said that it never occurred to him to say, well, that's not, God's never showed up in glory here. God's never knocked me down in the Nile before. But he had an overwhelming sense as God's glory is moving in. And the next day, I, I think it was morning. I can't remember if it was morning or night. But um, God began to move in the service and he said, God was, the glory of God came in a way we had never seen. He said, some knew instinctively it was God and ran to the altars and some just fell on their face. He said, some were afraid and looked terrified. Some ran out of the building. He said, most of the folks looked and didn't know what to do. And he said, this is, and, and I give him credit. He said, I stood on the edge of the pulpit and I said, folks, you've never seen this before. I've never seen this before, but this is God's glory. This is what we've been praying for. <laughs> it doesn't look like what we thought it would look like. It doesn't, it, it, it didn't, it's not anything we expected, but I'm telling you, this is God. Let's acknowledge that the presence of God is here. And it said it was just like a wave of faith just went over the congregation. And most of them just came and began to dwell in the presence of God. And they were there in the altar until I think about two or three that morning. And it was the first of years. They, they had to acknowledge the glory of God and they had to align themselves by learning to dwell in the glory when God per permits manifestations. I, I, I remember one of the toughest times I was going through in my life. Uh, I was trying to get established in the ministry. And 
back in those days, the only way to do it when you were graduated is just preach youth revivals and revivals in churches. And that's hard because I wasn't an evangelist. I've never been an evangelist. I never did, did well as an evangelist uh, because I've always been a pastor, but nobody wanted a pastor that was single. And so I was just, I could only do this. And I remember I was in a church in Chiefland, Florida, good church, good people, just a handful of folks. And I remember being in that altar area during the day praying and I said, Lord, I'm seeking your presence. I'm seeking your glory. I'm seeking your manifestation. And nothing, I feel nothing. I feel like you aren't, you don't even know where Chieflin is. And I said, that's the way I feel. And the Lord spoke to me and said, this is the way the pursuit of glory always is. He says, there's always more looking than there is receiving. But when the receiving comes, it's worth the looking. Ask him for appetite. Ask him to give you a hunger and a thirsting for righteousness. And then here's the last thing is just allowance. Ask God to come in his glory any way he wishes. Let me tell you a story I've told before and we're done. Uh, I'm going to ask the ministry teams to go ahead and move into position. Um, Joe Garlington, who I heard in, uh, at Jack Hayford's church several times and at James Robinson's Bible conference, it tells about a friend of his that's a pastor. It's not Joe. It's a friend of his. He never mentioned the name because he didn't want to appear insulting. But he said, my friend has a pastor friend who is well over 300 pounds, just huge guy. And um, he said that he had a church that he loved very much. The church was small enough that he tried to visit everyone's home over the course of a year. I mean, it was several hundred, but he tried to do it. And he would always carry a portfolio or a sheaf of papers under his arm because sometimes when he would, he, and he didn't call to let you know he was coming, sometimes he would just knock on the door and people would say, oh, pastor, please come in. We're so glad you came to see us. And he would make small talk for 10, 15 seconds. And his response was always the same. His response was always, well, yes, I'd love to come in. Sometimes he'd get supper out of it. Sometimes he'd get a cup of coffee out of it. But he'd always pray for them. But sometimes his response was, no, I, I don't have time. I'm not able to come in. Uh, I've got work to do. And he'd point to his portfolio, whatever it was. He said, I just wanted to pray. And he'd stand at the door and pray a blessing over them. And nobody knew why they were worthy of a visit or he wouldn't come through the door, you know. Both got prayed for, and this was the story. As I said, the man was like 350 pounds, something like that. And he said, I learned early on that not many homes have a seat big enough for me. He said, I've been embarrassed too many times by coming in and sitting in a chair that I can't get out of. He said, too many times I've come and sat in a chair that broke. He said that you don't know the embarrassment that that causes. He said, so I loved all of my people equally. I love them with all my heart. But he said, the first thing I need to decide is, have they got a seat big enough to hold me? And I was reminded, and Garlington brought this out too. I had a missionary family to Japan uh, at a church where I, that I served a couple of decades ago. Good grief, three decades ago, you people are getting old. And uh, <laughs> they said in the Chi uh, Japanese version of the Bible, um, th the passage we read, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Uh, the way it came out in the Japanese Bible is that when we praise the Lord, we create a throne upon which he sits. And he, he said in the Japanese culture, Depending on how we worship, God comes and is welcome on a throne or, or we haven't prepared a throne for him. And I think the pastor's in heaven now, but Joe Garlington said, we found out that it wasn't a matter of love. The pastor loved everybody, but whether he came in and stayed an hour and a half for supper or drank a cup of coffee. He was going to pray for you either way. But the difference is, was he going to just pray for you and leave? Or was he going to pray for you and, uh, and dwell? 
And I think that is a good way. It's not perfect illustration, but that's a good way of understanding the glory of God. Are we living our life in such a way that when he comes, he has a dwelling place? Or are we just groupies that just want to hit the high spots? It's our choice. When I was in Chiefland and I said, Lord, I, I, I'm not seeing your glory. I'm not seeing, does it do any good to pray for your glory? The, the Lord spoke something to me that I didn't understand. I don't think I've ever told anybody. He said, part of my manifestation of my glory, part of it is sovereignty and part of it's Stephen. Didn't understand what that meant for a long time. But I think what he was trying to say is there's some things I'm going to do whether you are worthy or not. There's some things I'm going to do in spite of you. It's my sovereignty. But there's some things I will do because of you, your hunger. Lo loved ones, as we go toward fullness, as we go toward fullness, let's open our hearts Let's open our hearts and say, Lord, I know glorification is for the future, but I want you to begin to show me your glory now and help me to respond well. Help me to host the presence of God well. Help me to live life so that when you show up in my home, in my life, in my family, in my business, Lord, help me have a seat prepared for you. Father, do it, we ask in Jesus' name. Loved ones, would you stand with me, please? I want you to have a great holiday tomorrow. I want to bless you as you go. But I also know some of you may need prayer today. You may want to come to Jesus and ask him to become the Lord of your life. You may be fighting a battle, and I know there are a lot of battles right now being fought. Um, next time I preach, I want to talk about it's almost like I want to go back to surviving spiritual assault. It's not. But I want to talk to you about the battles that we're in and how God wants to help us. I want you to come and let people pray for you, help you find Jesus. If you need prayer and you're watching online, call the number. Somebody's ready to pray with you. But uh, uh, this is a time, this is the day that we will look back on years from now and say, I don't know what happened in the heavenlies. I don't know what happened in the service. But on this day, I said, I'm going to make room for the king. I'm going to make room for the king because I don't want him to just visit. I want him to dwell. Father, do your incredible work, we pray in Jesus' name. In Brown Chapel, in the main sanctuary, if you want prayer, please come now. If you have to go, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. Give you his peace. We're making room for the king. We're making room for the king. The altars are open. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.